I am your host, Nicole Will, and we thank you for joining us as we navigate the world with your aging loved one. We are here to come alongside elders, family members, and the senior living community as we explore the world of aging and elder care with helpful resources, informative interviews, and approachable conversations. We get to do this together, so join us on our journey, and this is the Will Gather Podcast. We are so happy to welcome back Jill Sauber. She is the managing attorney at Sauber Legal Services. They offer that holistic legal representation, comprehensive estate, and elder law services. Welcome back, Jill. Thank you for joining us again. We, you know, had such a great time at our last podcast and really having such practical information for families and listeners to be able to have. And we had more questions and more, more things that we wanted to talk about with you. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me. You were able to share with us a little bit about your background, and part of that really consisted of having interactions with elders and their families and really understanding what they are going through and what issues are, you know, they're being faced with. Really looking, if we're highlighting the world that we're in, which is COVID-19, and some of those considerations For a lot of families, they have a loved one that is in lockdown, for lack of a better word, and whether it's in their home, whether it's in a skilled nursing facility, assisted living, independent living, there's a lot of different types of housing for for seniors. They're finding that their loved one might need more care. For families that have a loved one at home and they're thinking about moving their parent into senior housing at this time, what should they consider when they're signing those contracts, whether it's an admission contract, you know, that would allow them to have that oversight and the eyes on their care while they're not able to physically be there? Yeah, so I I like to talk specifically about the actual agreement, so the mm-hmm. contract that they get. And If you're planning ahead and it's not crisis mode, you might have more time to sit down and actually read the agreement. But a lot of times, you know, if they have fallen, maybe they're getting discharged quickly from a hospital or TCU, you might not have the time to sit down and really review it or send it to your attorney to review. Um, So I like to hit on what you're gonna see in the actual agreement so that you don't panic and you don't sign in the wrong place so that you're personally (laughs) financially liable. Um, so depending on the type of facility, if it's, um, I'm going to focus on assisted living or housing with services, because I feel like that's, uh, by and large, uh, where I get these agreements to review. So in the state of Minnesota, uh, just a little background, there's been a moratorium on nursing home beds since I think 1984, which means there aren't new nursing homes opening up or if they are, they're just kind of moving beds. In other words, you know, a facility might not have as many beds and they might give some of their beds to someone else. Mm -hmm. So when we think of a nursing home, we call them skilled nursing facilities or SNFs, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not gonna focus on them. You sign one agreement with a SNF. Uh, The benefits you get when you're in a skilled nursing facility is pretty comprehensive. And so I'll focus on assisted living and that's, Housing with services, so like um, independent living, bringing in care, uh, that's memory care units or with uh, dementia specialties, right? Um, You are gonna be getting, if you are sitting down with your parent, for instance, and they're gonna be the resident, you're gonna get presented with these agreements and it might be one big stack of paper. And what you will notice if you go through it is there's actually two separate agreements. And one is a rental agreement to rent the apartment or the unit. And then the second one is for bringing in care services. That's a care contract. So sometimes they'll combine them into one. But for housing with services, you're going to get two separate sort of contracts. So I want to I want to um, highlight that because you're truly just renting a space. You're just Mm -hmm. renting, you're leasing an apartment and you're contracting to bring in their in-home care provider, right? 
So know what that is, know what company they use and know what their sort of tiers are and level of care they're willing to provide. If you know that your loved one, they maybe they haven't been assessed recently for what their activities of daily living uh, requirements are for care. Maybe they need more than that facility can provide. So you don't even, you know, you stop reading at that point and find a different facility. Um, so I think number one is knowing that you're renting a space. Housing law in Minnesota is what covers that unit. So you can be evicted. You're not discharged like you mm -hmm. are in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. And then you're bringing in and home care. So you need to know what that looks like. Right. I wouldn't mind going through the actual agreement a little bit further. <laughs> yes, I we would love that because I think for people, typically they've never seen one before until they're in that situation. So let's walk through that. I think it that would be really helpful. So there's a, oftentimes a main kind of agreement, and that's going to be the rental agreement. And that's saying, yep, this facility has a bed available for your loved one, and you're going to rent it for this rate. Here's the base rent amount. And then there's going to be separate signature blocks for you to consider signing. I always tell my clients under the law, at least in Minnesota, the resident should be the one to sign if they have capacity. Always, always, always. So the facility, if they're giving you a contract to sign, if mom or dad is the one that's going to be living there, they're the ones that should be signing as the resident. The child may be acting as the attorney in fact under a financial power of attorney, but they don't necessarily need to even sign the agreement, not even as what we call a responsible party if mom or dad can sign themselves. So there's oftentimes five signature blocks. It's a lot. Yeah. So you're sitting in front of this agreement and maybe it's a crisis mode and you're presented with this document with five places to sign. And if you don't know any better, you might just sign all of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm cautioning against that. Mm -hmm. So there'll be the applicant or the resident. So mom or dad, usually. There's the resident spouse. In Minnesota, spouses have an obligation to pay for care. Familial responsibility, we call it. Children do not. But they are, they're going to request the spouse's signature of spouses around. The resident's legal representative, so that guardian conservator or financial power of attorney, that person or people could sign this agreement on behalf of the resident. There's also a spot for responsible party. This often, I, I would say the responsible party that's signing the agreement should probably be like the healthcare agent under an advanced directive. This is the person that they're going to call if there's an issue medically, mm -hmm. if there's an emergency, this is the first person they're going to call. So this isn't necessarily what I would say is the person financially responsible. It's more like your contact person. For this. Right. Kind of like that emergency contact. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I would argue that no facility could ever hold this responsible person or party uh, financially liable. Mm -hmm. Unless they sign in the fifth spot. Got it. And that's for guarantor. So okay. unless you want to pay for mom or dad's care and be personally mm -hmm. liable, don't sign as the guarantor. Okay. Right. Good tip. Yeah. So those are kind of the, that's what to look out for, I guess. In the okay. Really gives clarity because a lot of times you're just handed a stack of paper, right? It's kind of like when you close on a new mortgage, you're like, oh my word. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm but trusting you in that house. Trusting what you're putting in front of me right now. I don't know. <laughs> totally, totally. For those families that already have a loved one in a facility, what rights do they have, especially during this time? I think it's come up a lot for them to see or spend time with their loved one, especially during COVID. A lot of facilities are, and it varies state by state. So we'll put that disclaimer out there. But are there certain rights that families have to see and spend time with their loved one at all? So it is kind of a, so it's the wild west right now mm -hmm. uh, with COVID, unfortunately. I've gotten a lot of calls. Now we're on our kind of second round of lockdowns yeah. because we're spiking so bad. Mm -hmm. There is the nursing home bill of rights, and that's the rights of the resident in the nursing home. And we talked a little bit about how facilities are licensed and that makes a difference in the type of benefits and the statutes that apply. Housing laws apply, right? So if you're an assisted living facility, they can't necessarily 
keep out visitors because it's your apartment. Right. But they also can't evict you right now because there's an, a moratorium on eviction. So it's kind of like this weird, it's just a weird time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the, so at the federal level, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, what we call CMS, mm -hmm. um, they have issued a few guidance memos for nursing facilities. I have one in front of me, and the most recent one is updated September 17, 2020. Okay. This lays out some of the guidelines about COVID visitation because facilities were just doing random things and then basing it on the, the state's like governor's executive orders or just kind of making things up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, just saying, no, we're just not gonna let people in. Well, wait a minute, that's not, what, one, that's not okay, that's not legal. Mm -hmm. uh, two, you're using this executive order and the limitations as your reason for limiting visitation, which is we think wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you know, you're, you're limiting exposure to loved ones, which is going to be a detriment to the residents. So there's a balance that I, I fully understand facilities need to balance the risk. You don't want to expose residents and families and staff to COVID. But at the same time, people are dying because they're isolated. They don't, they don't get to see their loved ones and they might be getting sick from other things. So it's, it's just a weird, it's a really weird time. The, the guidance memo though, I will say, Mm -hmm. does provide some clarifications about outdoor visitation, indoor visitation. The whole time they've allowed for compassionate care end of life visits. So mm -hmm. if your loved one is unfortunately end of life, they have been letting people in, you know, testing them, questioning them, get, having them gown up, but they can be there with their loved one. I hurt for my clients because although I might be able to go in, as the attorney, and I can visit with my clients to sign documents and go through all of that. You know, I was just at a local facility here in the Twin Cities last week, and I'm inside signing documents with my client, mm -hmm. who's the resident there, the mother, mm -hmm. and right outside of the screen is the, the son and the grandson. It's like, you know, it just, it just seems silly, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I'm, we're right here. <laughs> Oh, it's <laughs> um, so hard. It's it is heartbreaking, and I I totally feel for the families, and I but I I truly I also understand that the other side of it, where the facilities need to be careful because then they run the risk that people are going to get sick mm -hmm. and they'll have an outbreak in their facility, mm -hmm. and then they have to you know deal with the consequences of that medical, legal, all of it. It's really one of those situations where you have empathy on both sides. We understand the position that the facilities are in really wanting people to be safe and protected. And we understand that it is heartbreaking for families to not see and spend time with their loved ones. So it helps to understand that it really is CMS at that federal level is putting together that over arching guideline and then understanding that was one of my thoughts was having in what circumstances are those allowable and you mentioned if someone unfortunately is at the end of their life that those families definitely have every right to have those compassionate care um, you know visits and spend that time so that really breaks it down. Are there any other rights or things that families should consider when they are visiting with a loved one? Well, so we in Minnesota passed some legislation. My timeline's now all screwed up with COVID, but <laughs> yeah, I'm like, <laughs> what month are we in? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's 2019, but don't yeah. quote me on that. Um, about cameras in units mm -hmm. in nursing facilities, and you have to go through the proper, you know, channels and get permission. Um, but you can have a potentially recording device or camera in the, in the unit. And I do encourage families, and a lot of facilities I'm seeing are also encouraging families, mm -hmm. to have some sort of a video conference system or uh, like Skype, FaceTime, something easy that the loved one can use mm -hmm. that you can stay connected rather than sitting outside of a screen window in, you know, 20 degree weather. That's right. Yeah, from Minnesota. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I think it's just with people being on lockdown and being a little bit more, what I would say, vulnerable and being in these facilities, whatever electronic access they have to the outside world is now being used for scam artists. So I would say as a loved one, 
you want to provide resources so that you can see them and talk to them, telephone, mm -hmm. internet, all of that, mm -hmm. I would just caution um, not to be Debbie Downer anymore, mm -hmm. but... Uh, <laughs> The thing, it's 2020. We, who knows what can happen? Get any worse? Like, stop I saying know. that. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, just in Minnesota, uh, they busted mm -hmm. one of the biggest scams for magazine sales uh, against vulnerable adults. So mm -hmm. elderly scam mm -hmm. uh, in history here mm -hmm. uh, just recently. And it just goes to show people are, are preying on vulnerable people even more right now. And mm -hmm. so just keep your eyes and ears open. If you go visit your loved one and you're, you're sitting there and then you see something suspicious, mm -hmm. maybe there's somebody else visiting this person and, and maybe you see or overhear something that just right. doesn't seem right. You know, pay attention because yeah. I just feel like people are, um, it's weird uh, right now. Yeah, yeah it, it is. And I think because there is that element of loneliness and people are wanting that companionship, they might be more susceptible to having that come about in not the, <laughs> the best way. I've never met the person, uh, they're mm -hmm. lonely and mm -hmm. isolated mm -hmm. and this person shows them care, affection, mm -hmm. attention, mm -hmm. and they start sending them money and gift mm -hmm. cards and... Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's yeah. a form of elder abuse. And I've seen it a lot more recently. For all of us that has someone in our life, just to like, you know, keep those eyes, like you mentioned, like eyes and ears open, um, be aware, pay attention if things don't seem right or seem a little off, you know, ask some more questions and kind of investigate a little bit. And you could end up really saving someone from some heartache and um, financial distress. Your point um, when you were talking about those different devices, so I know they have specific, let's say, cameras that can really just record, right? Kind of what we typically associate with, I'm going to put it in my loved one's apartment and I can see what's happening. Now we're in a world where we have, you know, Alexa and Google, uh, the screens in different ways, iPads, FaceTime, different ways to connect. Are those considered along the same lines as those, for lack of a better word, like a nanny camera? And do they need to get permission similar to those other types of security cameras? Because now there are so many different forms of being able to have eyes on things. <laughs> when is that line, you know, that threshold crossed into really needing some like legal protections, whether it's for the facility or for the family or the resident? Under the new statute that was enacted, it looks like the definition of electronic monitoring device mm -hmm. in a facility, in healthcare facilities, means a camera, including one that captures, records, or broadcasts audio, video, or both, okay. um, or other technological device used to monitor or communicate with a resident or others that's installed in a residence room or private living space. That's the mm -hmm. definition. So I would say yes, it would include all those, even Alexa that's just recording where you can kind of pop in and yeah. listen or mm -hmm. record. That would fall under the statute and the kind of notice requirements and everything mm -hmm. would apply. Really, a lot of families, this is a new thing for them. They've never, I would say, yes, people did have those devices and rooms to communicate, but because of COVID-19, it's really accelerated that and there's a lot more of technology in place. People are adopting it. We're using it um, as our means, you know, really to communicate well, here we are on Zoom, right? I know. It would have been fun to be in person, but maybe maybe in the future. <laughs> so let's say for families that they feel that the care being provided isn't adequate for them or their loved one, are there any laws in place that give families some independence in their decisions to provide care? And are they able to, let's say they have an uh, agency that the facility uses and they really are not happy with that, are they able to bring in their own agency that they've hired or that they would like to have them care for their loved one instead? What are the parameters that they can work with with that? So I'll just say generally, yes. It's, uh, it's always up to them if they're in a housing with services setting, like assisted living, and they're, they've contracted for that in-home care provider to come in, and it's not satisfactory, and they're not getting what they need or want. Mm -hmm. um, yes, 
generally speaking, you can bring in your own. What's in that contract, obviously, you're going to have to revisit and see kind of how to get out of it or if there's any sort of fee or notice requirements to cancel that contract. But yes, right. I mean, absolutely. You're, you're renting a unit. It's your apartment and you can bring in whatever care you want or need. So it really would be okay looking at that service care contract that we sign and what that allows. If it is, am I committed to this for a year? Is it based on month to month or whatever that looks like? They're going to really need to pay attention to that contract. Yeah. So uh, in my experience, most facilities housing with services that bring in in in-home care providers Mm -hmm. have kind of a base tier Mm -hmm. of care right and so that might be uh some personal services are provided maybe medication management Mm -hmm. just like really kind of their base right like housekeeping yeah yeah you may or may not be able to get rid of it but Mm -hmm. you can always bring in the increased level of care on your own you know right go to a a care provider that you prefer, Mm -hmm. uh, pay that base tier uh, level that you're getting Mm -hmm. and then bring in the additional. Yeah. So looking at our time in this world, it's so, we're in a place that none of us have really dealt with before. And a family decides, you know what, I really want to move my loved one out of a facility out of their apartment and into a home with me or into another facility that they feel is a better fit for them. What considerations should be made if they're wanting to break a lease agreement? And any thoughts or insights on what you would advise for people to navigate this process successfully? Yeah, so uh, also not uncommon right now is the desire to get mom or dad out of the facility and either, like you said, into Mm -hmm. a new one, Mm -hmm. uh, a different one, maybe closer to them or even in their home. I'll just reiterate what I said about general planning. I think always the first step is realizing the level of care that your loved one needs, what you see or what they tell you (laughs) um, (laughs) may not be what they actually need, right? So we have pride and ego and and denial and all these Mm -hmm. things that play into that. So Get an assessment done. If the facility's done one and they're going to be leaving that assessment, maybe you see if you can get another assessment done before they leave Mm -hmm. to see what the level of care is. Or you can get the min choices assessment through the county or work with a case manager or social worker that can help kind of coordinate the move, right? And they're going to be able to kind of assess what the level of care is. I, you know, I love the, the caseworkers, case managers, social workers that I um, work with, they just help manage that kind of day-to-day care conferences, assessments, uh, and can be a really good resource for families. If the assessment comes back and says that mom, dad, the loved one needs a higher level of care than you can provide in the house, or your house isn't accessible, you have a split level with a bunch of stairs, and they, they're uh, wheelchair bound or they're immobile, you might want to reconsider whether the house is a good place for them. Going to another facility, same thing. They're going to want to assess mom or dad at the new facility and determine if they can actually take care of them and provide what they need. So that assessment, I think, is step number one. It is. It's kind of getting the state of the state and, and a really accurate picture because I have seen that so many times. Someone says, I am great and I can do this and I love that enthusiasm, right? That's so Good motivation. Yes. <laughs> right. Keep it up. All right. Yeah, perfect. That's amazing. Reality, reality yeah. doesn't always kind right. of matter. Right, right, that's right. And it's saying, okay, but we really want you to be safe and have things in place. I think families really getting that accurate picture together to see if that's really going to be appropriate. And then also along the lines of touching on those contracts, when you are looking at different facilities, really understanding what your needs are because each facility offers a different level of care and some might say we can provide care from this level to this level but after you reach this certain threshold we're not able to do that and as a family if you didn't understand that fine print you could be in a situation where now you're needing to make another move or adjustment which can be very 
hard for for our loved one. And so really understanding, do I want my loved one to A, be home and we're able to provide care up until end of life? And is that is that um, adequate and doable? Or also with the facility, are they able to live here and we want them to live out their life till the end? Can they provide that level of care and even provide hospice or end of life care? And I think a lot of facilities are really understanding that people want that full picture and all of those services provided, that continuum as we like to say. And so that's another piece is let's understand where my loved one's at and what I long-term desire for them or they desire for themselves. And then what is our next move and is that appropriate and can they can they manage that wherever they are? I'm so glad you said that because that's really that's the first piece, right? It's like of course, yeah, you you go to our facility, you want to move them to a new facility and it's gorgeous and mm-hmm. you know mom will love it but they provide less care than where she's at mm-hmm. or it's it's kind of uh capped or topped mm-hmm. out at mm-hmm. what level of care she's gonna need in the next mm-hmm. six months and then like you said then removing her again and then uh, as a second thought after the kind of the medical care adl mm-hmm. necessities uh, mm-hmm. assistance with adl uh yeah mm-hmm. to have the the possible future benefits mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. every facility accepts medical assistance benefits and Correct. some facilities don't have beds available or they might have a one to two year private pay requirement mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. mom's getting down an asset to find this beautiful facility that can accommodate her care great you get her in there she loves it and then a year in she's reduced assets to the point where she's now qualifying for benefits she cannot privately pay anymore mm-hmm. and they're saying well we told you at the very outset that there's a two year private pay requirement here mm-hmm. they may or may not work with you or they may say yeah we can't afford to keep mom here now as an elder law attorney i have my own thoughts about this whether yeah. that's actually appropriate or legal and then we get the ombudsman involved but yeah. uh, <laughs> but no going in If they say they have a a two-year private pay requirement, don't put mom in there, Mm -hmm. even if she loves it, if you know you're going to have to move her in six to 12 months, right? I mean, it's just that added stressor too for people with cognitive impairment. Right. You're going to move her. So you talked about the ombudsman. For people that don't know who that is or what that is, can you clarify that a little bit? Yes. So in Minnesota, we have an ombudsman for long-term care. They're sort of a, uh, they act as an advocate for residents and families uh, related to care and facilities. So let's say you run into an issue, mom is at a facility and you have questions about the the care she's getting or you suspect there's maltreatment or abuse or something. Uh, You can call them and they will act as an advocate for your mom, go to the facility, maybe do their own investigation of what's going on. And then could, if there is, you know, something going on, could Mm -hmm. help Mm -hmm. you or your mom, you know, file a complaint with the appropriate people or or contact Adult Protective Services or do what they need to do. But really, the ombudsman is amazing at being an advocate and having a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice Mm -hmm. that when you go to sign an agreement at a facility, they have to provide you the ombudsman's Mm -hmm. contact information. And it has to be posted as well. And this is a free service, correct, for families to use? Yes, absolutely. And I encourage them to do it, to call Mm -hmm. if they have any questions about a facility or care. Absolutely. This was so helpful. You know, it's not always glamorous (laughs) or really fun, but it, we feel more settled when we have the tools we need to make informed decisions. So This just brings us more into that place and we will include all of your information for people that have questions and we're so thankful for your knowledge and your ability to want to help people and give them the information that they need. So thank you again, Jill, for for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is Jill Saber with Saber Legal Services. The information that you've heard today is prepared and presented for general information purposes only. The information is not legal advice. Legal advice is dependent on your 
specific circumstances or situation. And I encourage you to reach out to a professional to discuss any sort of elder law issues that you might have. And because the benefits are case specific, I recommend you reach out to legal counsel in the state where you reside. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed our episode, please subscribe and give us five stars. <laughs> in all honesty, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening to our episode.